Hello my soccer universe, it was a very long evening yesterday, two matches going to overtime, one went all the way to penalties, but the two matches were very very different and it was as expected, Spain against Germany, two teams trying to play for the win, Portugal against France, two teams trying to avoid defeat and being very cautious in the process. So the early evening was pure drama and heartbreak for the host nation, it has to be said. And I think Spain overall were a slightly better team despite all the narrative in the German media. The other one I also thought that France maybe were the overall more solid team but I think the better chances fell to Portugal. So this was a little bit more of a coin flip. We also saw a few careers ending, at least international careers. We had of course Tony Kroos, this was his last game. And then we also had Pepe, for sure playing his last international. I'm not so sure about Cristiano Ronaldo, at least his was his last Euro game. But before we go in that one, Jersey Major Bingo, oh, how was I overthinking things yesterday. Spain against Germany, as expected, we don't need to talk about that a whole lot, but I had original down. France in white jerseys against Portugal in red jerseys and then I thought oh no we have to take the entire kit matchup into account. Portugal play with green pants. France, I have not seen them with white pants, they will play white blue. The blue pants and the green pants might be clashing. No no no, no. France has to play in blue and white pants and blue socks. Which anyway would have been a weird look overall. I guess in the end it was the right matchup, I was just overthinking it. And that's all that there is to it. But let's get started with the drama in Stuttgart, the game that everyone was looking forward to, where already in the press conferences both teams kind of said, yeah, we have a similar approach to the game. And the Nagelsmann also kind of hinted at, but you know, I know how to get to the Spain team, we need to be a little bit more physically. And yes, he made a few changes. For instance, you know, he brought Emre Can on in midfield next to Toni Kroos, meaning that Toni Kroos had to be also a little bit more physically. And that early on really showed Spain controlled the early stages of the game had the first chance through Pedri, however Tony Kroos did his best to get sent off in his potentially last game. I mean the foul on Pedri should have been a yellow card and I think he stepped on Laminia Mal's foot, that should also have been a yellow card, I think he could have been off with a red card after 15 minutes, but that also shocked Spain because Pedri had to come off after 8 minutes, seemingly twisted knee and probably his tournament is over. Not good. Dani Olmo came on and what made me most happy about this game is that this change did not impact the game. No, it actually decided the game in favor of Spain because it was then Dani Olmo who was man of the match who eventually scored the first goal and also assisted the equalizers. But I have to say refereeing was a major talking point in this game. There were way too many yellow cards handed out. This game was physically, the game was great and yes there were some obvious yellow cards in there by grabbing and so on. But overall I didn't think it was such an unfair game that we had seven yellow cards on one side and eight on the other. That was not quite cool I would say. But yeah, Germany got themselves into the game Again, Spain more of a threat, however there were then two headers for Harvard in the first half where you know if you place them a little bit better Germany could have well taken the lead as well. So overall the game was hanging balance, slight advantage Spain and Spain then played the advantage early in the second half. Nagelsmann redid a few of his changes, he brought on Andre Forjan, he brought on Wirtz for Sané, so this was now more or less the A lineup again. But initially it didn't quite work, as I said Spain created a big chance through Morata and then Yamal plays a beautiful pass to Olmo and he takes the shot from the edge of, of the box calmly into the net. It is 1-0 Spain. And at that point I even thought yeah this was a deserved lead. However then something happened that I don't quite understand. Spain got a little bit more passive the longer the game went on. Yes! Bring Mittelstädt and Füllkrug on for Gündogan you know, taking off the captain. That was a weird decision, but I think it gave Germany the impetus to really go forward. But it got an even weirder. They decided to take Laminia Mal off and brought on Ferran Torres. That is the first change that I didn't understand. And I have not been playing it too much, but for me this game was very much a parallel to what happened in 2006 when Germany played Argentina in the quarterfinal, where it was also Germany facing the first tough opponent and the opponent that was the best team in the tournament so far. 
And the Parallels were really there, especially in the second half, with almost scoring this early goal like Ayala did for Argentina back in 2006. And then also Argentina holding back and Germany going all out on them. And I have to say the changes did not get better. And back then I also would say that the Argentinian coach made major errors in uh, his substitutions and especially not bringing on Messi. Around the 80th minute, he took off Nico Williams, the other player that was a threat in there. He took off Morata, so the other captain goes off as well. And brought on Oyar Sabal. Then maybe I could understand a little bit more because you want to be a little bit more mobile up front. But then Nagelsmann takes off time, brings on Müller. It is all-out attack for Germany with not much security in the back, I would argue. And I'm always wondering, you know, if you're pushing for such an equalizer, aren't you messing up a potential overtime? This is something that I never really quite understand when in times of desperation, coaches completely mess up a system without thinking for the next part. Or maybe they are thinking and they're thinking, yeah, maybe one of these strikers then can play in midfield. I don't know. Same thing for Spain. You know, you take out all your threats and those are young players. I mean, they could play 120 minutes, I could argue. So yeah, it was then very defensive and it actually then showed it over time. But you needed to get to overtime. Fulkrug had a huge chance. A header more or less on the ground. He was pulled. Potential penalty right there, but he got his header off and it hit the post. Then I think there was a really bad kick out from Una Simon that got to Harvard where Harvard is running onto him. He needs to get his lob right. That was a glorious chance and Harvard has the skill to do that. In the end, it is then Florian Wirtz where Germany really exerted tons of pressure onto the, as I said, very passive Spanish team. Kimmich heads it back and Wirtz just puts it in the net in the 89th minute for an equalizer that made the stadium in Stuttgart just erupt. With that equalizer, I thought there's only Germany coming out of this one as winner because they were now the team that had the momentum. But Oyasabal had an early chance and early on in overtime, I thought Spain might actually not do it to Germany again, but that didn't last long. And there were more chances created by Germany. Germany in the end really went for the win. And it was a really tough situation for Spain because not only were you a little bit on the back foot and Germany trying to go for the win, but you also know if this goes to a penalty shootout. And yes, this German team has nothing to do with previous Germany teams, but Germany has not lost a penalty shootout since 1976, the first ever penalty shootout in a big competition. You don't want to play Germany in a penalty shootout. And then the scene that all of Germany is still talking today, when Musiala takes a shot and it hits the hand of Kukurea. I honestly don't quite understand why this wasn't a penalty. I was very relieved that it was not a penalty. From what I heard is that, yes, one arm is at the hand, he is a little bit tilted and the other arm is hanging down vertically. So it is not make an active move to make it bigger. In addition, he's trying to pull his arm back. I guess this is the explanation for it. But I can also see the German point a little bit that the referee Taylor did not want to make a decision right there that decides the game. Again, I did not quite understand what was going on there, but hey, it did not go. And then Dani Olmo puts in a cross and Merino is free in the box. Rüdiger for once, not with his man. He does the splits mid-air, heads it in and gives Spain a winner. And then dances on the corner flag. The same dance that his father did in the early 90s when he scored for Osasuna against Stuttgart, which I also thought, thought was an interesting uh, tidbit that I did not hear initially, but now I got to hear it in the podcast this morning. But we were not done yet because Völkrog had another free header in stoppage time already. And then Dani Kavachal gets himself sent off after having seen already a yellow card in overtime, already missing the next match. He took one for the team because it really does not matter for him whether he gets another yellow card there or not. But in the end, Spain move on just by a tad, the better team overall. But I think Luis de la Fuente almost messed up here. After the final whistle, I actually thought it was quite remarkable how everyone knew that it was Toni Kroos's last game and how especially the Spanish players went up to him. Immediately his teammates, but I remember especially Avaro Morata coming to him, clapping and hugging him. They put a lot of respect towards him. And I thought this was actually quite interesting. And yes, the German public was relatively gutted by that one. You saw a lot of empty faces I can feel with them because that's how I felt after Austria got eliminated. But I don't feel too bad about them either. And I hope that the German jerseys now will pop up on sale somewhere because I really want that one.
Spain move on and Spain look now to be the big favorites to win this tournament. At least when I not look at ratings and so on, just by the eye test. Spain look they're great. But then they're also missing Dani Kavakal and Lenormand in the center. The latter maybe not so much of a trouble, but you know, that might play into it. Over to Hamburg, where, you know, we all expected Portugal-France to be a relatively tight affair. And to my surprise, at times, the game threatened to become interesting, especially the way France started out. I really thought, oh, are they playing offensive today? Well, that didn't last long. And Portugal did have a threat. They again played Rafa Leão and then they again played Cristiano. And we all said, if Cristiano is playing, he will be perfect for France because Saliba in the center and Upamecano, they will know how to handle him. They are way more physical. And yes, again, I don't want to diss Ronaldo for his career. I always recognize he's a great player, but he's clearly over the hill. I'm more annoyed that Martinez decided to bank everything on him. This guy played every single minute at the age of 39. That doesn't make much sense. That's my problem with the whole thing. As I said, there were chances here and there, first half, second half. I think the biggest one fell to come a winger in the second half where the ball comes to him. He's close to the goal, just pulls it wide. There were a few tackles flown in there. I think Rafaleo at one point was through where then I think again Kamavinga tackles him to get the ball off him so it, uh, he, he cannot get the shot off. I also thought, is Deschamps killing international football? by having this very negative approach that then Southgate and others copy because we know that international football you don't have too much time to work but you can always make a solid defense that's why this tournament is a little bit a hard watch at times. Overall I think if I think of the second half there were two really good chances I think one by Bruno Fernandes and I don't know for whom the other was two early good chances for Portugal then there were three good chances for France the biggest one by Kamavinga it goes nil nil. Mbappé being a non-factor, Cristiano also more or less being a non-factor, Mbappé with his mask not looking good. Over time, more of the same. I think the most interesting part of overtime were the breaks when you could see the two old guys for Portugal, 39-year-old Ronaldo, 41-year-old Pepe, sitting on the floor where everyone else is doing the huddle and they are being massaged. This was such an odd image, but also Didier Deschamps making a huge decision by taking off Kylian Mbappé, who was not up. And I guess the nose is really bothering him. There was a situation where, you know, he got a ball onto his mask and you could see it's really hurting him. And he goes off and immediately puts the ice bag on his nose. Inevitably, it goes to penalties. The real weird thing is that I thought that Portugal probably had the better penalty takers on. I mean, Cristiano converts his first one, Bernardo Silva converts his second one, João Felix puts his one on the post, but I still think that he's a great penalty taker when I compare it to whatever Frost brought up. Usman Dembele, I don't trust this guy. Fofana, phew, really? Okay. Kunde, didn't see that either. Barcola, young guy. And then Theo Hernandez, I know he can convert penalty because he has done so for Milan. But not only did I think that Portugal had a better penalty and was really impressed how France did it, France expertly converted. Either the first two went down the middle and then all of them high in the corner so that Diogo Costa cannot save them. Theo Hernandez converts his one. Mike Mignot didn't have to make a single save. Like France are in the semi final without having scored a goal from open play. It is such a weird tournament for France. However, they only concede one goal so far. They are really tight at the back. This is France for you. I think they could stop Spain and I guess with a few guys in defense missing, but France need to score from open play for what? But I guess they can penalty shoot themselves to a tournament win as well. So if you look at the projected bracket, nothing has changed because the two favorites went through and, you know, it is still France that are slightly higher rated than Spain. As I said, for the eye test, I think I would favor Spain. I can see why France are still favored because they had the better results overall. Today, we have two other quarterfinals. We have first England taking on Switzerland. I don't expect a great game, but I'm really curious what the Swiss will do. I hear that uh, England and Switzerland match up quite well. I would expect another turgid game, especially since Southgate will chain down his attackers. And then I think we'll get a wild one between the Netherlands and Turkey. Merit Emiral, because of the Wolf salute, has been suspended for two games, which caused major diplomatic incidents between Germany 
and Turkey already. Erdogan is in the stadium, not necessarily to support his team. He will do that too, but also to kind of lay down why are you making such a deal out of that? I just want to say in Germany, this wolf salute, which is a right wing gesture within Turkey, is not banned. However, in Austria, for instance, it is banned and you can go to jail for that. You are cracking down on political gestures on the other side. I would think I know too little. But if this wolf salute is really the equivalent of the Nazi salute, if a player does a Nazi salute, he is gone for the rest of the year. I was always gonna root for the Dutch, but now it makes it even easier, honestly. In any case, please let me know your thoughts on the games today. Give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video. Subscribe to my channel if you want to see more videos like this. I'll talk to you soon. More things in my soccer universe. Bye. Hey there, I really hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, here are some videos and playlists that you may enjoy too. Also, please consider subscribing to my channel and hit the little bell icon so you get notified whenever something happens in my soccer universe. And with that, have a wonderful day. Bye.